All right, let's continue this afternoon with our review of skeletal muscles, and we're going to move on to Roman numeral six, muscles that move the pectoral girdle. But before we can do that, we have to examine a couple of words here. Let's take a look at this word, girdle. In anatomy, a girdle is any bone or bones that attach an appendage to the midline. And if you don't know what an appendage is, that would be your arm or your leg, or in our case, arms or legs. Pectoral is a reference to the upper chest. So what this is referencing is either a bone or bones in the upper chest region that attach your arm to the midline. In this case, the two bones in the pectoral girdle include the scapula and the clavicle. And you guys all know that from class from our bone review. So let's take a look at the major skeletal muscles that are going to affect and move the girdle. And then by extension, will move your whole arm. Check it out. Pectoralis minor is the first muscle. And let's take a look at it. Okay, and you can see it's actually deep. Pectoralis major, the big chest muscle, is going to be right here. We'll do that one next. But this is it right here. Pectoralis minor. What's minor mean? Small. Pectoralis means chest, so this is the small chest muscle. All right, let's take a look at the origin. The origin is ribs 3 through 5. So there's rib 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's the origin. Okay, so that's where it's going to stay still. The insertion is the coracoid process. That's a projection that comes into the uh, comes out of the front of the scapula. Now take a look here. Here's the origin. Doesn't move. Here's the insertion. And remember, you don't have to use these three bundles all at the same time. You can use them separately. So we have a couple of different motions that are going to occur. Check this out. Okay, it's going to depress the scapula. Now look, the origin is below the insertion, so it can pull the scapula down. Now, if you're sitting at, sitting at home in your chair or at your desk or wherever you're working during this COVID time, just kind of pull your shoulders and just like pull your arms or point them straight to the ground. You don't have a lot of motion there because your rib cage gets in the way, but you can pull the scapula down. The other one is it's going to move or rotate the scapula to the front. As you can see, now you can't see it in two dimensions, but the coracoid process is a little bit behind the front rib attachment. So not only can it pull it down, and actually can pull it towards the front and move your or help move your arms in front of you. Now, this is the cool thing. You guys remember this. The scapula does not have any direct articulations with the midline. So the scapula is freely movable. That's why if you want to use the scapula as an origin, what do you need? Fixators. Well, these are all in place. So watch, if we lock the scapula, then this becomes the origin and this becomes the insertion. What? Yeah, check this out. You can reverse the origin insertion on any muscle that's directly attached to the scapula and it can do other things. It's pretty cool. So what's going to happen? Okay, action. It's going to elevate the ribs. Now look, if this stays still and this muscle contracts, the insertion is going to go up. It's going to elevate ribs three through five. That's going to make the chest, uh, chest cavity larger and that's what you'd need to do during forced inspiration. And we've seen this before. This isn't somebody uh, telling you you have to come up with a great idea right now. Uh, it's actually breathing in heavily. That's what it is. So that's pectoralis minor. Let's take a look at the next one. Serratus anterior. Now, this is a cool muscle. Check this one out. This one looks neat. Here's serratus anterior. Now, if you've ever seen a bodybuilding competition and they do that, that overall like bicep pull down or the lat and you'll you'll see these finger like muscles sticking out right underneath pectoralis major which is right there pretty cool let's take a look at the origin origin of ribs one through nine and you can see all of those and it's individual but this is one muscle with individual but uh, bundles going out to each rib insertion points got to be somewhere on the scapula it's going to be the inferior angle so you can see that right there that's the insertion point here is the origin. Now, what's that going to do? Remember, it's always about positioning. Where's the origin relative to the insertion? So it's right here, and you got some up there. This is going to be interesting. Watch. It's pretty cool. It rotates the scapula up and laterally. So laterally is to the front. So when we say rotation, it'll, it'll go up into the front. This bone will go up into the front. And you can see you have a wide range of motion because of all these individual bundles. Now, this is another one. You can also reverse the origin insertion. So you can make the ribs the moving part, lock the scapula, and then this becomes the origin. If that's the case, then you're going to lift up and out on ribs one through nine. Hmm, wonder what that is. It's going to elevate the rib cage during forced inspiration. 
And, and think, just sit there right now. I know we're not together and I can't watch it, but take a deep breath and just feel and look at what happens to your chest. Take a deep breath, go, <gasps> Your whole chest, your whole body like arches up because you got to make that chest cavity really wide for air to flow and rush in there and get maximum oxygen. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Number three, trapezius. This is the large kite-like muscle. This is a shape word. This refers to its shape, a trapezoid, on your back. It's gigantic. Watch this thing. Here it is. Here's the traps, and that's what they're called, trapezius muscle. In a bodybuilder, you know, these get real big, and that's kind of what they have that no neck look. But this muscle gets so big, it kind of fills in that gap and almost goes straight to the shoulder like that. Okay, let's take a look at the origin, and obviously this is a large muscle that can be subdivided. Now, had we got to this on your cat, this is actually three muscles, but uh, sadly enough, we didn't make it through the rest of the cat. Disappointed. Very disappointed. The origin is going to be the occipital bone. Cervical 7, so there's actually a space here where it's not touching any vertebrae. Cervical 7, and then T1 through T12, the whole middle of your back. This muscle's gigantic, okay? Insertion point is going to be the clavicle, the acromion, and the scapula. That's where all of those pieces come together. I'm sorry, the spine and the scapula. The acromion, the spine, it's right on that hard point of your shoulder. You can kind of feel that muscle coming down. It could go out to the point of your shoulder. And then just kind of grab that muscle. You know that muscle where somebody pinches it and it always makes you go, yeah, yeah, stop doing that. Well, that's that's what I'm talking about. Now, what can this muscle do? Let's take, oh, I'm sorry. It's divided into three functional groups. Remember, always keep this in mind. You do not have to use a whole muscle at the same time. You have absolute finite control by way of your brain. Pretty cool. Action. Okay. If you use and that U right there, that stands for upper fibers. And I'll define that in a second. The upper fibers are going to lift the scapula up. So there, this will be the origin. This will be the insertion if we use the upper fibers. And you can see it's going to go in that direction. It's going to go up. So just sh shrug your shoulders and lift them up towards your ear. That's the upper fibers. You can also use the middle fibers. So here's the origin in the middle fibers. Here are the two insertion points. So when this muscle contracts, these points would start to come. They're not obviously going to come together, folks. Don't believe that. They're going to start coming towards each other. So just rotate your scapula. Try to touch the medial surfaces of your scapula. Some of you probably could do this if you're one of those uh, weird, twisty people. Just pull your scapulas in. Adduct means to go towards the midline. Elevate is up. Adduct is towards the midline. And then you can use the lower fibers, and that's going to depress or pull the scapula down. Again, not a lot of range of motion here because your rib cage gets in the way, but we can subdivide it. See, here's the upper fibers. Those elevate. Here's the middle fibers, kind of just to differentiate them for you. Those adduct or pour, pull the shoulder blades towards the midline, and then you have the lower fibers that pull the scapula down. So a multifunctional muscle and again, in a cat, it would be three separate muscles. But in a human being, it's just one muscle with functional groups. Okay, number four, levator scapulae muscle. Okay, so this is this is easy. Levator means elevate, raise, and that tells you what it does. It raises the scapula. And I'm going to keep this one real short, by the way. Okay, so you can see it's anchored on the cervical region. And then, does anybody remember what this was right here? This is the inferior angle down here. This is the superior angle. But you don't have to, I'm, I'm kind of, trimming some stuff down as we try to speed up and make sure I get this in before the end of the year. Okay, action. Obviously, it elevates the scapula. That's what the name means, levator scapula. So again, helping to shrug your shoulders. And why do we have uh, multiple muscles doing the same things to the same bones? One of two reasons, either power or range of motion, or in some cases, both. Pretty cool. All right, let's take a look at rhomboidus minor and major. Now, I couldn't really differentiate this, so, you know, when I made this PowerPoint, I kind of used the spray paint thing. And this little guy right here, that's minor. What does minor mean? Minor means smaller. Good. And then this big one right here is major. And rhomboidus refers to its shape. Can you see its shape? So you have a big one and a little one, same shape. Let's take, now they do the same thing, so we're going to keep, we're going to keep them lumped together. There's minor and there's major. I guess I should have clicked on that before I started talking about it. That's why I hate PowerPoint. You got to memorize the slide. Now, what does this, this is cool. Now, in the standard position, look, here's the origin right on the vertebral column. Here's the insertion on the medial border of the scapula. You can see this is higher 
This is lower. The origin is higher. So the insertion has to go towards the origin, which means it's going to go up. It'll elevate. It can also adduct. It'll pull the scapula in. Origin's on the inside and up. So it'll go up and in, up and in. Okay? Now, this one, I'm going to have to explain it, dude. It'd be so much easier if I was in class and I could show this to you. I guess I could turn the camera around, but that'd be weird. All right, forced downward rotation. Now, check this out. If we relax this muscle and we activate muscles above the scapula and we lift it up here, lift your scapula up. Now, I'm going to use my finger here. Here's these muscles. Watch. But if I lift the scapula up, now the insertion, I'm exaggerating, obviously. Now the insertion is well above the origin. So if I violently contract this muscle, what's it going to do to the scapula? Now, keep in mind, the scapula has been rotated and lifted up. So now the insertion point's higher than the origin. If this violently contracts, it's going to rip the scapula back down into position with maximum force. When would you need to be able to do that? Anybody know? Anybody know? Oh, I know. Throwing anything overhand. You need to have force down rotation of the scapula to apply force and accelerate the object. All right, now, let's wrap this video up. The skeleton does not supply, and I hate reading the slide. Let me just read the slide. I know it's annoying. The skeleton does not supply a lot of support to the shoulder joint. I'm telling you right now, the shoulder joint, in a phrase, is loosey-goosey. Does anybody know why? Why does your shoulder joint have to be really loose and, I would argue, almost unstable? Ah, that's right. Range of motion. Remember, when we came upright, what are our upper appendages for? They're not for forward mobility anymore. They're for manipulating objects. So you have to be able to put your arm and your hand, by extension, anywhere in three-dimensional space so you can manipulate objects and tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to do that, we have to really, I say we, the planet had to really loosen up the shoulder joint. I'm not saying it's strong, but let's be, let's be honest. Compare it with your hip joint. It's not even close, okay? So there's really no solid bone-to-bone -bone contact. So how do we keep this thing in there? Hmm. Oh, sorry. Let's do the why first. Apparently, PowerPoint knows more than SCURB does. Why? Uh, this increases range of motion. I just said that. Very good. Everybody got that one? Now, how do they do it? Four tendons in a circle. This is how you stabilize this joint. There's no direct bone-to-bone -bone contact. To get range of motion, we got to make sure this thing is loose. So it's going to use four tendons. One in the front, one on the bottom, one on the top, one in the back. That's why it's so easy to dislocate a shoulder. Plus, if you guys recall, does anybody remember the glenoid cavity? Anybody remember the glenoid cavity? It was really shallow. Does anybody remember the one in your hip? It was really deep. The less bone-to-bone -bone contact you have, the more range of motion. So there's two things. One, there's a, there's a teacup-shaped piece of cartilage in which the head of the humerus fits in, like a suction cup. Anybody know what that's called? If you've ever damaged your arm throwing overhand, you know. That's the labrum, okay? So that's a little bit of help, but not much. And then nature wraps these tendons around. So let's just take a look. The tendons are named for the muscles. It's one and the same. So we're just going to take a look at these four muscles. Remember, one in the front, one on the bottom, one on the top, and then one in the back. Okay, I'm sorry, one in the front. This is the back. What am I talking about? Here we go. And those four tendons are called the rotator cuff. So that's how you stabilize the shoulder. You got the labrum, and then the four tendons called the rotator cuff. Now let's look at the top one. There's the top one right there, supraspinatus. So there's the muscle in the supraspinous fossa, and it comes out, and then that tendon is attached to the top of the humerus, and that keeps it from flying out. Pretty cool. All right, let's take a look. In the back, and I, and I said this wrong before. I apologize. Help me out. The back one right here is called infraspinatus, and that means under the spine. You can see its tendon comes off, and it's right on the back of the head of the humerus. The next one is called teres minor, and its tendon is on the bottom. So I got top, back, bottom. And then there's one more in the front called, well, why is it not coming up? Oh, there we go. Uh, there's one in the front called subscapularis, named after the subscapular uh, fossa. And it's in the front, and I'm going to show you that right now on the picture. You got that note? Got that note? All right, let me show you on the picture. There's the muscle in the subscapular fossa, and it's coming. the tendon comes out right on the front. And that stabilizes the uh, shoulder. And you can see the acromion comes out so that the humerus can't exit out the top. So when you look at dislocations, most commonly, 
It's because you overextended your arm or you hit the point and you drive it down and out because there's really nothing directly under it. Nothing. Okay. And that is uh, Movers of the Pectoral Girdle. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back uh, videotaping on Monday for our next lesson. And we are zooming forward and a test is coming. So make sure you're taking notes. Make sure you're keeping up. And most of all, have a good time if you can. I'll see you next time, guys. Have a great weekend.